al-Qab, etc. And this is why you can find in the hadith concerning Hajj, where Prophet ﷺ had said, you know, for women, when they were going for Hajj, that they should not wear niqab or gloves. The fact that he's telling them not to wear niqab meant that they were wearing niqab. That it existed amongst them. So it was a part of what was approved by the Prophet ﷺ. And it is something commendable. It is something recommended. It is something which Islam not only approves of, but also honors. Right? So to refer to it as being Arab culture, this is misguidance. And this is modern interpretation. Right? And of course, there may be aspects which were, we could say, localized. The idea of wearing black. Now, wearing black, we cannot say that the religion says women should wear, their, wear black. That this is what they have to wear. That is, and that was common to Arabia. That was the preferable color which they used. And as people from Arabia, Muslims spread to different parts of Muslim lands, they carried that with them. But in reality, Islam does not prescribe that a woman wear black. It could be brown, it could be green, but in whatever, the colors are preferable though. There are darker colors in the sense that they should not be uh, eye-catching, like bright yellow, bright red, you know, flashy flowers and colors and, you know, because the whole idea of trying to discourage, you know, people staring and being attracted and things like this is lost by, you know, wearing garments which become equivalent to the garment that you're supposed to be covering with your outer garment, right? So these kind of interpretations, you know, these uh, we have to be aware of and know that the only way to interpret and to understand the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is to understand it as the companions had. And we have an example from the life of Imam Ahmed, who was jailed because of his uh, opposition to those who were claiming that the Quran was created right? and that the law was everywhere. In any case, he was brought before the Caliph and he deb debated with one of those who were promoting these deviant ideas at the time. And he said to the person, when the person was the representative of this innovative, innovative views. He said, inform me about this matter which you are calling people to. Is it something which Allah's messenger called people to? Okay. His claim that the Quran was created, Allah is everywhere. Could you find any hadith? Is there something in hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said this? He told people, come and believe this. The innovator said, no. Imam Ahmed then asked him, is it something that Abu Bakr Siddiq called people to after him? Or Omar ibn al-Khattab? Or Uthman? Or Ali? He said no. So he said, so it is something that neither Allah's Messenger, nor Abu Bakr, nor Omar, nor Uthman, nor Ali, may Allah be pleased with them all, call to. Yet you are calling people to it. It is not then unreasonable for me to say that they either knew this matter or they were ignorant of it. Either they were aware of this or they were ignorant of it. If you say that they were aware of this matter, yet they remain silent, does that make sense? That they knew this, this is the correct belief, correct understanding, but they remain silent? That is obvious, obviously wrong. And if you say that they were ignorant of it, but I know it, then, O oh, wicked son of a wicked one, the Prophet ﷺ and his rightly guided caliphs were unaware of something, yet you and your friends know about it. You know, this is the claim when a person innovates in the religion, whether he introduces celebration of the Prophet ﷺ's birthday, you know, or whatever other innovative uh, practice, celebration of the, you know, the uh, New Year with the Hijra, you know, New Year celebration. Other, these other kinds of celebrations that people have introduced amongst themselves. What in fact are they saying? They're claiming basically that they know something 
that the Prophet and his companions didn't know. Or they knew about it and they hid it. One or the other. But Prophet Muhammad said, Taraktukum ala mahajjatin bayda. Layluha kanahariha la yazigu anha illa halik. I've left you on a clear white slate whose night is like its day. And no one deviates from this except is destroyed. The religion is clear. The night of the religion is like the day of the religion. No difference. Night and day usually we use this as a metaphor for the opposite. The night is, this thing is like, the difference between them is like day and night, we say. But in Islam, there's no difference. The day is like its night. And whoever deviates from this path is destroyed. This is the clarity. This is the religion of Islam. And somebody may say, okay, I'm not trying to bring anything Prophet didn't do. But what I'm doing is something which is good. It's a good thing. We'll call it bid'ah hasana. A good bid'ah. Right? Because, you know, it is good for us to remember Rasulullah on his birthday. You know, this makes us closer to Allah. You know, it reminds us about Allah, reminds us about the message which the Prophet brought. So this is a good thing. How can you say we shouldn't do it and it's a good thing? Well, Prophet said, Ma taraktu shay'an yuqarribukum ila Allah illa wa amartukum bi. I have not left anything which will bring you closer to Allah without instructing you to do it. He said that. Meaning that you cannot find anything today which will bring you closer to Allah which Prophet ﷺ didn't tell us to do. If you found something, it's not bringing us closer to Allah. That's what this means. Just as Imam Malik said, on the day when the verse was revealed, al yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum. Right? Today, the religion has been perfected or completed for you. He said, whatever was not religion on that day can never be religion. Whatever was not a part of the religion of Islam on the day when that verse was revealed can never ever be religion. That is the correct understanding. And this was the way of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad now what we find, Allah saying in Surah Al-Nisa, the fourth chapter, verse 59, Allah there says, And if you dispute in any matter, then return it to Allah and His Messenger if you indeed believe in Allah on the last day. That is better and more suitable for determination. Where we have differences, where we have different opinions, etc. And this is natural. We as human beings will never escape differences. Differences will remain amongst us. But the question is, how do we resolve our differences? What do we do with these differences? Do we say, you have yours and I have mine, you go your way, I go mine? Yeah. As Allah described in the very beginning, describing those who become like the kuffar, كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ Every sect or every group is happy with what he has. He goes his way, he goes this way. I have mine, it doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want to do. I've got mine. No. Allah tells us here that when we dispute, we have to take it back to Allah and the Messenger. This is the way in which we resolve the differences amongst us. Now, we do have a number of different organizations which function within the Muslim world today. Whether it's Jamaat-e Islami, Jamaat Tabliq, Ikhwan al Muslimin, Mursi movement, whatever, we have a bunch of different groups. And these groups have leadership. 
and the leadership call people to make bay'ah to them, to give oath of allegiance, to follow, follow them, you know, all the time, come hell or high water, they say, you follow them. The sunnah, the way of the companions, was that bay'ah was only given to the khalifa, the head of the Muslim, not to any Omar, Khalid, Hassan, who pops up. He says, I've got a group. I got the best way. Make bay'ah to me and follow my way. No. There is a hadith narrated by Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. He said, the people used to ask Allah's Messenger about the good, but I used to ask him about the evil, lest I should be overtaken by it. This hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, volume 9. So I said, O Messenger of Allah, we are living in ignorance and in a bad atmosphere. Then Allah brought us this good, Islam. Will there be any evil after this good? And he said, yes. I said, will there be any good after that evil? He replied, yes, but it will be tainted. I asked, what will be its taint? He replied, there will be some people who will guide others not according to my tradition. You will approve of some of their deeds and disapprove of others. And I asked, will there be evil after that good? And he replied, yes. There will be some people calling at the gates of hell. And whoever will respond to their call will be thrown into the hellfire. And I asked, O Messenger of Allah, will you describe them to us? He said, they will be from our own people and will speak our language. I said, what do you order me to do if such a state should take place in my lifetime? He said, stick to the jama'ah, the main group of Muslims and their imam. Hmm? Who is that? The ruler, the khalifa, Amir al mu'minin So I said, and if there is neither a group of Muslims, Muslims are all scattered up, splintered up into all these different countries and nationalities and everything else, nor an imam, a khalifa, to whom all of the Muslims can rally. He said then, فَاعْتَزِلْ تِلْكَ الْفِرَقَ كُلَّهَا Then turn away from all of these sects, even if you have to bite the roots of a tree till death overtakes you while you're in that state. This is the guidance. This is the statement of Rasulullah Sallallahu What is this telling us in practical terms? It's telling us not to commit ourselves to any organization which seeks to divide itself from the mass of Muslims. This is what it's telling us. It's not telling us don't organize, don't try to do things in an organized way. This is the Discovery Islam Center here. You know, I don't stand up and say, hey, we need to close down the center now, you guys are, <laughs> you know, don't do anything. No, this is not a group seeking to divide itself from Muslims. I am the director. I'm not calling people to make bay'ah to me. <laughs> okay, this is just a, a means of organizing da'wah activities. We come, we go, I come, other people can come. You know, this is not, it is just an organization to try to do things in an organized way. That's all. But where that organization transforms itself into a movement where you now have a leader who calls people to give the oath of allegiance to him, where now you're going to follow and then you start to look at people who are not a part of your group with the, what they call the us and them mentality. You know the us and them mentality? If you're not with us, then you're against us. Right? That looking at people with doubt, 
Because what we're on, this is the right thing. Anybody who's not with us, making the bay along with us, they are off. They are misguided. Right? And you hear that in ignorance. You have some people who say, when they do their Islamic work, they call it Fi Sabilillah. The path of Allah. We're on the path of Allah. So you might be going to make jihad. And they will ask you, have you gone out to Fisa Bilillah? So I'm going to make jihad. No, he said, did you go out for 40 days? I mean, <laughs> hey, hey, you know, they have turned 40 days now into Fisa Bilillah. If you're not doing these 40, you're not Fisa Bilillah. This is misguidance. This is misguidance. The way of the Prophet Muhammad and his companions, that is the way. What they understood fi sabilillah to be, that is fi sabilillah. The way in which they conducted da'wah, conveying the word of Allah to the people, the non-Muslims, the people in their communities, people outside the community, that is the way to do it. And any other way is doomed to failure. Failure, not necessarily meaning they will have few followers, because an organization may have millions and millions of followers. They may be very huge and, you know, but is the issue one of numbers? If the issue were one of numbers, then we would have to say Muslims are straight. Right? Because they are not the majority on the earth. Some people ask, since Islam is the right way, why aren't the most of human beings Muslims? <laughs> right? You know, can't argue from that point of view. If most of the Muslims are going to the graves and praying to the saints, and only you guys, Wahhabis, you know, Ali Hadith, you know, any other, what they consider to be a dirty name they can throw on you, right? You don't want to go to these uh, the shrines, you don't want to honor the saints, Everybody else is doing it. If the issue were numbers, then we'd have to say they are right. right. So the issue is not the issue of numbers. It's never been an issue of numbers. The issue is concept. If the concept is correct, even if only one person is following it, as Allah referred to Prophet Ibrahim as an ummah, all by himself. The whole of his people, everybody were into idol worship, but he alone was off. And he was right. So, it is important for us to consider the way, the way of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that that way was one way. There are no two ways about it. Of course, within that way, there may be variation in the sense that in prayer, one may raise one's hands to the ears, or one may raise one's hands shoulder height. Prophet did both. So within that way, there, are, there is variation. And wherever Prophet has given us variation, we are free to follow any of the variants. But in the variation, there is still one way, because even though we may be following some of the variants, each one of those variants represents a part of that way. So, my brothers and sisters, let us reflect on how much or to what degree we are, in fact, following that way, knowing that it is the only way to Allah. It is the only way to success. It is the only way to paradise. Insha'Allah, that is the, or that is what I wanted to share with you this evening. Um, if you have any questions now, we can look at your questions, and hopefully the questions will be on the topic. You know, where we can further elucidate that way, we can further reflect on that.